and what I really noticed at the South by screening was the framing of this movie. Did you direct this? <laughs> this is amazing. What I gotta say first of all is I watched your video. Oh really? My yeah, review. yeah. I saw your review. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I was trying to figure out a way of how to, you know, get my friends that are my age to understand this and enjoy it the same way they would, you know, what, you know, read a Batman comic or or a Superman. So I wanted to. This is a this is a kind of love letter to my mom in a very strange way to see you feel it like that for me was the most nourishing thing so thank you there you are you are a beast I want to start off with my favorite line in this film. Yeah. Uh, and it goes, if a man wishes to challenge the gods, he must become more than a man. And what struck me so hard about this film was the fact that it felt like all the stories we were told as children truly came to life. I'm curious to know on a personal level, how do those childhood legends and stories inform your personal decisions in a, in a storytelling regard with this film? What I gotta say first of all is I watched your video. Oh, really? My yeah. Review. Yeah, I saw your review. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I got sent it from my producer, Joe. And um, the way you spoke about this movie, all of the pain that I endured, all the chaos, uh, to see you feel it like that, for me was the most nourishing thing. So thank you of course, yeah. for being my Hanuman in this situation. <laughs> thank you for yeah. making a film. I mean, this is so unique. You know, for me, so harking back to the mythology, basically my grandfather, you know, he lived in Kenya. My dad had this chain around his neck. With a, with a monkey holding a mountain in one hand. And whenever I used to ask him, you know, what, what's that about? He would say, wait till your grandfather comes home from Kenya and he'll tell you the story. And he told me these stories of the Ramayana and all of these kind of mythological epics. And they just, um, it, it, I was enthralled really. And um, I was trying to figure out a way of how to, you know, get my friends that are my age to understand this and enjoy it the same way they would you know what you know read a batman comic or or a superman so i wanted to ground it and make it gritty and and and, and palpable i want to kind of you, you mentioned the batman i kind of want to mention the hollywood of it all because this film feels like the perfect blend of the cultural and like political elements of bollywood films yeah. but also that high octane energy of hollywood films i want to i want to ask you what are some of the bollywood inspirations for this one because i just it, was, it really hit. It yeah. felt like I was watching a movie with my mom. <laughs> I think, first of all, it's, it's music. You know, music is so part of our culture. I can't, I can't dance for the life of me, but I feel like, you know, in Indian cinema, there's at least five to eight dancers in a movie. So for me, we had to put a musical piece in, and that came in the form of the training montage. You know, I was like, how do we, you know, do our ode to Rocky or, you know, Creed or one of those, you know, great training montages, but make it rhythmic, make it of our culture. So I got on the phone with uh, Ustad Zakir Hussain and I was like, I want to do a juggle bandi, an Indian yeah. classical call and answer. Uh, you're going to be on the tabla and I'm going to be responding on this dusty, you know, sack, basmati rice sack. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, music is a huge part, you know, you, even in the most violent sequences, you know, you'll see these characters come in with these beautiful kind of saris and spinning and and you know i am a collision of all these kind of things so in terms of bollywood cinema the first bollywood film that really stuck in my brain was this film called koila with charu khan and i didn't even remember the the full plot but i remember the the kind of red he had these like possessed red eyes and he was sweaty and he was holding this knife and he couldn't talk. I think the bad guy had shoved some like flaming hot coals in his throat. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it was, it was really, it really stuck in my brain. Um, but anything Shah Rukh does, yeah, I'm a, I'm a diehard right. Shah Rukh yeah, fan. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it's the culture, it's the vibrancy, it's, it's, it's all of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I kind of wanted to switch gears. I think this, the personal storytelling in this movie is is crazy like i cannot believe like you were able to implement all of these great cultural elements together um and upon doing some research on you i found out that you're no stranger to mother and son inspired stories <laughs> uh, in an interview a few years ago you said as you can see i'm harping on about my mom yeah uh, i love the stories that you've chosen that revolve around the love of motherly characters and in regards to monkey man i think culture is 
one of the most connected things within a South Asian family. Mm. Uh, was there any sort of moment with your relationship from, with your mom that inspired story beats from this film? I think everything. I think, you know, first of all, I'll say in terms of the culture aspect, like I, I spent a lot of my early childhood running away mm -hmm. from my Indianness. Yeah. You know, I felt ashamed. It, you know, it wasn't cool to be associated with anything Indian. Um, so actually, I was trying to appropriate any other culture but my own. And I think there's a lot of people that I talk to my age that can respond to that. And, you know, so for me, I was like, okay, if I'm going to start making a film, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle a genre that, you know, people think we're not cool enough to even be a part of. And then I'm going to double down and triple down on the culture in every single way. You know, those goofy three-wheeled rickshaws, we're going to make a really cool one. You know, you know, the old Indian classical music, like every single part of the culture, I was like, we are going to double down on this and, and show, show people that it can be cool, it can be inspiring, it can be philosophical. Um, you know, and so that was part of it. What was the other part of your question? Sorry, there was, uh, uh, it was just like, oh, my mother, yeah, my mother, yeah. Your, your and and for me, yeah, and like for, for me, this is, a, this is a kind of love letter to my mom in a very strange way. You know, in this film, this, this mother is his, not only is she kind of like a leader figure in this village, but she is, she's his best friend, she's his idol, she's his teacher, you know. For, for me, she, whenever you see her, she's kind of surrounded by trees and nature. She, to me, represents, you know, the grounding nature of religion and motherhood. She is mother nature. Um, and he's fighting to protect that. And if you see in the kind of like the actual present world, we're drenched in this kind of neon light and, yes. and, and like everything is mechanical and, and suffocating. And you go to, to his mother and she is pure and soulful and she, hit, she is his roots, literally. So for me, there's a prayer that kind of is echoed through the film. And this is a spoiler, so cover your ears for five, five ten seconds. But <laughs> at the end, he's talking about worshipping a god, that god is his mother. I, there is a line, uh, Umera Hanuman. <laughs> that one, I think that could you, was there, was there a lot of truth to that one? Was that something that like was consistently like present throughout your relationship with your mom? Because for me and my mom, for sure, it's, I think a lot of, like you said, running away from our culture. Yeah. She was the main thing that brought me back to it. Yeah. I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. I, for me, my mom has been kind of my biggest fan. My, she, I wouldn't be here acting if it wasn't for her. I wouldn't have any kind of physical capacity if it wasn't for her taking me after you know working two jobs you know cooking dinner for the family then taking me through a very rough neighborhood to go train three times a week yeah. in this martial arts class you know and uh it was you know it was terrifying you know and and she was she was there and you know there's a lot of gang culture where i grew up and i could have easily gone the wrong way if it wasn't yeah. for this woman so f for me like you know, even though it's a hyper violent action film, I think all of the things that she's instilled in me, I'm kind of displaying in, yeah. in this story. Yeah, um, I want to talk about the grand but also personal nature of this film because I think the story of Ramayana and Hanuman could easily be like a two hundred million dollar plus epic movie with hundreds of extras, a bunch of CGI. Hmm. What kind of led you to a humanistic manifestation of telling this story? I think for me, one of the earliest stories of Hanuman is very kind of similar to Icarus. Hmm you know, this, this young monkey that could have had any mango in the, in the forest, but he yearned for one high above the trees, essentially the sun. And upon, you know, capturing it and eating it, he was punished by the powers above him, the gods. And for me, that was, that's an interesting story to tell a child because maybe you're, you, you want your child to reach as high as he can. You know, you, you don't want there to be any limitations to your dreams. So, you know, that that was where the, the kind of birth of this man with scarred hands came from. And all of these things started to flow out of me. But, um, yeah, the mythology has so much to, to, to give you, you know. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think a, a figure like Monkey Man is something... Hmm. We need it in the media right now. Yeah. Whether it's for people that look like us or don't look like yeah. us, I think it also just makes it more culturally relevant, right? When you were coming up with this script, was there any part of you that was trying to inspire people, like younger people? Yeah, yeah. Like us? I think we're, I mean, everyone, people that look like us and people that don't, I think everyone is the underdog of their own story. Yeah. And for me, Hanuman is an underdog. He's someone that 
had great potential and needed to be reminded of who he was uh, by other underdogs. And together they kind of challenged the status quo. And, um, and you know, for me, it's a huge thing. I want, I want us to be represented in all types of cinema. You know, I, I've been lucky enough to be in, in, in an Arthurian legend or play the version of Dickens and David Copperfield. But, you know, this was this kind of part of the world where I could only be the funny sidekick or the guy that hacks the mainframe. I was like, no, you know, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carve my own lane with my own body, my own bones. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of your bones, um, at the South by Southwest world premiere, I remember you mentioned that obviously you had broken your hand. Yeah. Uh, and you filmed that entire kitchen sequence with a broken hand. Yeah. It looked absolutely flawless to me. Yeah. Uh, how did you All of the it? fights, basically. Yeah. I mean, no, it, yeah. even there was um, that la not, I don't know if it was the last one, but it was the one where all the salaries are flowing around. It's in that bar. Yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. What in the production shifted because of your, your broken hand? Well, it's like you should have seen the videos of me in the in the uh, kind of training room because you know when you got two hands and you get to grab objects and block and do everything at the same time, it's far more visceral, yeah. you know, and it's faster. You're you're a lot faster. So you know, after the surgery, there's just a lot of blood and it's very <laughs> painful. Um, but uh, we had to change everything to kind of one-handed choreography, which was. Um, which was, you know, sad, but you know, this was the kind still, of still looked amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and you can see when I'm crawling in the in the big uh, bathroom fight, you'll see my hand is quite swollen, yeah. and the continuity of this hand throughout the movie is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think throughout the entirety of this film, technically, there's so many brilliant choices. One of them being a lot of this movie being handheld. Mm. Uh, was that something that you planned from the very beginning to give it like a raw feel, or was that kind of informed on set? It was partly my kind of ADHD and like me wanting to get people to to feel what I feel as a performer or when I was a kid when I was competing what it's like to actually you know put on a kind of you know a guard and like get punched in the face and feel what it's like to have it's so claustrophobic that kind of tunnel vision nature it's it's you know I, I wanted them to almost smell it you know and um at the same time, every day we face catastrophe, you know, like if, if our camera was broken, we're on this tiny island during a pandemic. So, you know, th there's a big, uh, the scene where my, the rickshaw we drive gets T-boned and we, we couldn't get another camera in. The light's coming up, we don't have another option. So I was just like, take my phone, let's shoot. So one of the shots in there is from my iPhone. We couldn't get a, a water tank, so my producer Joe and I, he, he filmed me in the bathtub in the ed edit suite, you know, and that's in the film. There was, a, there was a scene, kind of a Diwali parade, and we had a crane that broke. Um, and so I was like, let's get a rope and let's swing it above the crowd and create this sort of what I termed a pendulum cam. And then, uh, you know, I had Joe, because one of the studio execs was around. I was like, keep her occupied because she doesn't want this to happen and we'll do this thing. And, uh, you know, then I was like, why don't we make it even tougher? And whilst it's swinging, have some men dancing in the crowd, detach the camera and run through to join the crowd. So from obstacles came opportunities and new ways to innovate. I think that choice of taking the camera off the rope and running with it, one of the craziest things I've seen in a movie recently. Wow. And I absolutely love it. It truly feels like I'm within the actual like the volley scene. <laughs> and I think it's because we've experienced things like that, right? We've experienced the chaotic nature of it. Um, and I think part of that is also just like that grid of India. Yeah. It's like everything is so raw. Everything is so visceral. Uh, when you were coming up with the look of it, it's it's very raw, but it's also very neon. And it's like digitally like sleek. Mm. Uh, were there any specific inspirations you had for like the visual aspect of it when it comes to other films, TV mm. shows, any kind of media? Yeah, I think... Um I guess the feeling sometimes I was trying to elicit is 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 voyeurism, mm -hmm. and Wong Kar Wai does voyeurism better than anyone. Yeah. You know, like he he's he's a kind of underdog guy that infiltrates this club, and he's you know he he notices Shobita's character from afar, and he's he's absorbing, he's absorbing, and that's kind of building his rage. That's building his rage. He's building, he's building, and brooding. So that element of voyeurism was very important, and I wanted to find kind of like obscurity i wanted it always to be like peeking through little cracks or like you know we created these little glass partitions that you could kind of like you know when he's watching her dance but uh yeah i would say that was a big influence uh so 
can you kind of talk me through that process of, you know, what happened with uh, streaming services, acquiring it, and then mm. Peel obviously acquiring it after the fact with Monkeypaw. How was all of that going through your head? And, you know, how are you feeling throughout that process? Yeah, I mean, for me, I wanted to create an action film that was sort of a Trojan horse that was talking about a lot more, you know. So, you know, I wanted it to sort of be a gateway drug to people that don't know a lot about our culture to finish watching this movie and want to dive into a lot more. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to talk about subjects like, you know, I was in India, you know, when, and I was in a relationship with my co-star, you know, when, you know, who's an Indian woman born and raised, you know, my best friends were in India around the time of the horrible, you know, Delhi bus rape. Um, and, and what happened to, you know, dear Nirbhaya, kind of the rage the nation felt, the rage that I felt was something I, it was so foreign to me. So like, you know, to talk about a movie about, you know, violence against women, police brutality, about, you know, religion, you know, and how religion can, you know, you know, be a very divisive force and, and used, you know, it can be monetized and used in politics, but at, at its best, you know, it makes us fight for each other, not fight against each other. So all of these topics, I wanted to kind of wrap in this kind of genre movie. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, actually these are global topics, not just Indian topics, but yeah. I think what makes this movie unique and the way you're able to wrap it up so well is because of the mythological roots of mm. it, right? And I found the socioeconomic commentary to also be brilliantly handled. Could you talk about mixing those two pretty big yeah. like, ideas together with yeah. the script? I didn't answer your question about the studio thing. I, well, what I'll <laughs> say in the end is that basically I didn't want to, I didn't want to pull the punches, yeah. the, the spiritual punches of the film, not the literal ones, you know, the philosophical, what the identity of the movie was had to, I wanted to stand by that. I didn't just want to do an action film that felt like just a video game where the violence kind of doesn't feel justified or earned. I wanted to have that revenge catharsis, but revenge is such a maximal feeling. It needs as maximal a catalyst. So, you know, that's where we parted ways with the studio, you know, and um, luckily Jordan Peele saw the film and he he's a, he's a guy that makes genre movies that say more than you know, they're Trojan horses too, so he completely understood what I was trying to do, and that's where the birth of this uh, Universal and the theatrical release came. Yeah. I'm super happy people are gonna be able to see this in yeah. the theater. One of the main reasons of that is because, like I like I keep on mentioning, is the technical elements of it. Uh, one of the main things I liked, and what I really noticed at the South By screening was the framing of this movie, and the way that it kind of like lined up with the character arcs, like the way that it's used in like the underground ring scenes, but then also in like, the bigger overall. Did you direct this? <laughs> this is amazing. No, I'm just, I, a, I've been obsessed with this film yeah. since I've seen it. Haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Um, my aunt, uncle, cousins, everyone loves all of your movies oh. and I've been hyping this movie up. <laughs> so hopefully they all oh, like no. it too. <laughs> oh boy. But, I mean, the framing is, has been, has, was brilliant in this film. Can you talk about kind of aligning the uh, technical like camera aspects of it with the character arc element of it as well? Yeah, I think in terms of the action standpoint, I wanted to capture the element of, of desperation. You know, like sometimes choreography can be too aware of itself. You can feel the kind of the choreographer's hand. And, um, you know, I, I wanted it to feel raw and jagged. So the camera, when we start off in the wrestling ring, you know, it, you know we, we hired one of the, the stuntmen who was shooting the previs is this guy called Steven who literally is a stuntman, you know, you can kick him through a wall and he knows what to do and, you know, smash a, you know, a glass bottle over his head. It's like, Steven, you're going to operate a big boy camera and you're going to be on the team, the camera. And it was incredible because he could literally get underneath the action inside the armpits of the characters and, you know, in a tussle. So that became the wrestling ring, you know, claustrophobia and chaos. And this character who can't control himself, that the filmmaking around that was more jagged and raw. And then as, as he gets better with the help of Zakir and these other characters, we start to pull out a bit wider and it starts to become more of a kind of, you know, more balletic, a kind of violent ballet yeah. of sorts. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned the inspirations from Korean cinema at the South by premiere. Uh, do you have any other like specific movies you'd like to shout out in terms of like the technical inspirations? Technical inspirations. I mean, 
Oh God, it goes every everywhere from you know Enter the Dragon, which you know using the reflections in the mirrors at the end that we kind of you know use in ours to like I said Wonka Wai to I mean, there's so many I don't even know where to begin. Um, the Raid is is one yeah. of the the great kind of action you know films ever made, but the Koreans do it better than anything, and I feel like the Korean cinema is actually quite similar to Bollywood in a way. Yeah. You know, uh, you know they're more no holds barred, but the when it comes to emotion and pathos, they double down, triple down on, on, on a look and a feeling. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's really important. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention a character moment in this movie because I personally have just been curious about it since seeing it. Um, I think after the training montage, which is one of my favorite training montages of all yeah. time, leading into that kitchen sequence, like the kitchen fight sequence, uh, the character, he takes off his mask, right? He's worked all of this time, he's earned it. What was that character decision of kind of him ripping off that mask going into the yeah. kitchen sequence. First of all, I just wanted everyone to know that I was doing all of it, <laughs> you know, because it so frustrates me when you got a, a great actor and a movie star and then, you know, there's some big franchises out right now and then the helmet goes Shh, and then they're doing all the coolest stuff and I'm like, no, you didn't bleed for that. <laughs> You didn't get a punch in the gut or the ribs. Yeah. You don't know what it feels like. And the audience wants that. <laughs> That's what they're paying for. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, for me, it, that was important. But now he's not hiding anymore. Yeah. Like Hanuman, you know, the iconography is entrenched in his soul. It's in his fiber. So the mask f at that point, you know, he goes from being a man, a performing monkey, literally in a ring, dancing for money. And now there's no disguise necessary. Yeah. He, he is the incarnation that he wants to be. I have to wrap it up, and I do want to ask you one more thing. We mentioned those mythological and socioeconomic ideas before. Do you have a drive to keep telling stories like this in the future? Because I really hope you do. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. All right, sweet. That's that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, man. A blast. You're so talented, and thank, thank you for the beautiful questions. Thank you so much. I yeah, appreciate it. you're a rock star. Thank you. <laughs>